there. Uh, what's interesting about the church at Colossae, and, uh, and, and by the way, the church at Colossae is really this letter wasn't just written to the church at Colossae. As you read the book of Colossians, you'll see that Paul says, share this letter with them that are at Laodicea and, uh, and, and others. Uh, are you good to go back there? Are we working? Okay. All right. Uh, but um, but th- this was a, a, a triad, basically. Uh, uh, this letter was uh, composed for a, a triad of churches there. Uh, Colossae, uh, Laodicea, you've heard of that one. Uh, and then here's one you probably never heard of, and it's Aeropolis. And, uh, and so you have Colossae, Aeropolis, and Laodicea. They're all right there together. Uh, interestingly enough, these were all situated there uh, uh, leading on the way to Ephesus. But interestingly enough, uh, Paul never visited the church at Colossae. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting that, that the, the book was uh, written to them by Paul uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the church was probably founded by Epaphras uh, because Paul never even visited it. Uh, he just simply wrote them a letter and admonished them. And so uh, Colossae is unique in that aspect that this is a church, a group of people that Paul's never even met before. Um, uh, the book <coughs> uh, is, is, uh, is kind of a dispu- uh, disputing book, a disputational book. Uh, is written for the purpose of refuting the heresy that existed there at Colossae. There's a lot of people who are, who are believing in Gnosticism and, uh, and, a, and a general kind of brand of Gnosticism uh, that they uh, had there is kind of made up brand of it. It was a mixture uh, of both Jewish and Hellenistic uh, elements all combined together. And uh, the Jewish sect of, of this Gnosticism, they were, and by the way, there were a lot of Jews that had, had sought refuge in Colossae. So there was a lot of Jewish people there. Unlike the book we were in last week, this place was flooded with Jewish people. Uh, but uh, the Jewish people, they had concerned themselves with the dietary laws and, uh, and the keeping of Sabbaths and circumcision and angels. And uh, that was kind of their focus. And, uh, and, and, and it became rather problematic because they were getting away from by grace are you saved through faith. And they were kind of going back like the church at Galatia. They were kind of leaning back toward adding works to grace and reintroducing the law. The Hellenistic influence, however, would be more obviously heathenistic. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and they, um, they placed an emphasis on wisdom, uh, or you know, wisdom comes from God, knowledge comes from college. So uh, I guess I should change that from wisdom to knowledge. Uh, they placed an emphasis on knowledge, uh, you know, trying to be the, the, the smartest guy in the room, you know, the, the, the Plato, the Socrates type of element to it uh, uh, there. And uh, cosmic powers and then a basement of the body. They were, they, they were new agey, if you will. There would be kind of comparison to kind of new agey here in our day and age. And so this was what Paul was trying to help this church with. Uh, uh, you, you had this kind of new agey, cosmic type of follow the stars, astrology, uh, you know, wisdom, uh, false wisdom. And then you had adding of works to grace over here with the Jews. And so they're coming together and the Christians are being pulled every which way. So that kind of gives you the idea of why Paul is writing this letter to them and, uh, and he's trying to basically terminate the heresy uh, that is infiltrating uh, into the churches there in that particular area. And uh, so uh, the outline of the book, and I, like I said, I will give you this. You have my word. I'll give you this next week. I do apologize for you not having it. Uh, but the outline of the book is Jesus Christ's Lordship, Jesus Christ's Lordship and the false teaching, teachings at Colossae, and Jesus Christ's Lordship in the Christian life, and then you have your conclusion. Uh, quickly, I'll show you your main message in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Here's the main message of the book of Colossians, of the letter. It says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And uh, they were that right there was Paul's main verse, the pinnacle of just obliterating this Gnosticism that, that Christ was just... Uh, a weaker version of a higher power that we won't give a name to. And they were trying to uh, uh, basically add Christ to the list of gods, if you will. 
And, uh, and so uh, Paul was decimating their doctrine by saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. And, uh, and so that was uh, highly important. Uh, uh, more than any other place in Paul's epistles, any other epistle of Paul, uh, he gives the fullest presentation of the doctrine of the person and the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you'll, you'll not find another epistle that does a better job. All is its word of God. But in this particular area of emphasizing the very person and the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ and his position in the Godhead, Colossians is the go-to place. I love the book of Colossians just for that. Uh, I use the book of Colossians when I'm dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses and others, and I'll show you why here momentarily. Just a tremendous book. Uh, so <clears throat> we look at the first point of our, our outline, which is Jesus Christ's lordship, his lordship. And uh, as you look at chapter one and verse number one through verse number eight, that is your introduction. This is, this is normal, the apostolic greeting that Paul gives from church to church to church uh, as he's writing these letters there and uh, offering them peace, thanking the Lord for them, appreciating their prayers. Uh, verse number four, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, uh, he, he's saying, I don't know you, but I've heard your believers, so I'm writing you a letter. I think that's pretty special. He never even met him, but he loves him. He cares enough about this group of people to say, let me, let me give you a letter and try to help you here uh, in the Lord. And uh, so you see that, that, uh, that um, salutation there that is given in verses one through verse number eight. Uh, now you see... He begins to tell them about all of our past, present, and future. Uh, verse number four, he says there, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, uh, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, that is all of our past. If you're here and you're a believer tonight uh, or watching uh, by way of the internet, uh, your faith in Jesus Christ, that's already happened. If you're a believer, that happened however many years ago. You know, you ever stop and do the math on how many years you've been saved? It's a long time, isn't it? Uh, every year it goes by so quickly, and uh, you start saying, my, what, what year was that? You know, for me, it would have been like 1985, 1985, I think, when I asked the Lord to save me and got the assurance of my salvation as a teenager. But boy, time flies, what, 95, 2005, 2015, you know, I'm, I'm close to 40 years saved, you know what I mean? It's amazing, isn't it? Life goes by a lot, uh, real fast. But, uh, but that's your past, your faith in Christ. But continue in verse number four. And of the love which you have to all the saints. That's your present, your love that you currently have. You were saved, and now you have, present tense, this love for all the saints. And then you see your future, verse number five. Uh, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you have before uh, uh, in the word of truth of the gospel. And so you see your hope, which is coming, the coming uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's what you have there, your kind of past, present, and future. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go through the book of Colossians here in a minute and show you uh, how power-packed it is with doctrine, as we said a moment ago. Uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, breeze through some of this here. Um, you see Paul prays for their growth in the Lord uh, in verses 9 through 14. For this cause we also, since the day... We heard it. Heard what? Heard that they were saved. Heard that they had some Christian brothers, that there was a church that had formed at Colossae. <coughs> Since the day that we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Also, we're praying that you'll be filled, filled with the knowledge of his will. I don't know that we preach enough about that, about people knowing what God's will for their life is. Every child of God ought to be filled with the knowledge of what God's will for your life is. God has a plan for all of our lives. For some people, God's plan is to be a layman in the church, to provide for your family, lift up the arms of the pastor, be a soul winner, reach this world, and try to help build the local church. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Some people, God's called them to be missionaries, to, to whether here or abroad, you know, and go and, and give your life in full-time Christian service. That's awesome, too, you know. 
Some people God's called to pastor. Some people God's called into evangelism. Uh, you know, some people God's called into Christian education. I believe that's a God calling into Christian education. You know, uh, but but God has a will. Some people God's will is to get involved in music and write music and that edifies the. the I mean, God's will is, is is very big. You know, it's broad. It could be in many different things. And uh, we praise the Lord when you are filled with the knowledge of God's wisdom. This is what Paul said he's praying for. He said, I'm praying that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I want you to be filled with this knowledge of the will of God for your life. I want you to have all wisdom uh, there and spiritual understanding. I want you to know what the will of God is. I want you to be wise so you don't mess up and do something dumb. And then I want you to be Know the Bible. Be filled with spiritual understanding. I think that's a good prayer for anybody. What's God's will for your life? Get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. And then know your Bible. Be a student of the Word of God. And those are three good points for anybody. A great prayer for anybody. That was Paul's prayer for these people that he never even met before. Um, he prayed for their growth in the Lord, and he continued on there. And, uh, and then... Um, <clears throat> he says in verse number 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us uh, meet uh, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, whom hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What, what a God. What has he done for us? He delivered us from the power of darkness. He translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I, I, I love when I get to come to church because I get to come into the kingdom of his dear son. And uh, one of these days, boy, I tell you what. In verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so the question may be asked there, who, in whom? Who, whom do we have redemption through his blood? Well, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. And so now he continues on, speaking of Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And, uh, and so we stop right there for just a moment and we remind folks, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. What is God? God is a spirit. When God in scripture, the Bible says like in the book of Psalms, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither ear heavy that he cannot hear. The Bible talks about the Lord's hands, the Lord's ears. The Bible talks about, God says, I will turn my back to them. He talks about his back, you know. Uh, we, we find out about these, these body parts that God has, but what we find out is he's not a man. He doesn't have body parts. And, uh, and so God attributes to himself uh, these human characteristics so that we might be able to better understand him you know, uh, in, in a more intimate way. Uh, but certainly God doesn't have hands and all that. He is a spirit. He's a consuming fire, the Bible says. And uh, uh, the, the big old fancy word that'll get you extra credit at Bible college is anthropomorphism. And uh, anthropomorphism is the attri attributing of human characteristics to God, <laughs> you know, and how God does that through, through Scripture. And, uh, but, but here the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is, he, he is, he is God incarnate. It is, it is now we can see God. We see his flesh. Now, not us, but uh, back in these Bible times, they could see God. As they, when, uh, that's what the Lord said to Thomas. He says, why, why ask you me? Show us the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and my Father are one. He was explaining to Thomas that, I'm God in the flesh. I am here. I'm God in the flesh. Uh, so anyways, uh, it says there uh, in verse number uh, 15, uh, the firstborn of every creature. Firstborn of every creature. Uh, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him. We're still talking about Jesus here and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. We're still talking about Jesus. Now, if somebody says, oh no, now he's talking about the father here. 
He's talking about the Father here. He's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Father. Say, well, then let's just keep reading. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You start with Jesus, you end with Jesus, and everything in between tells us that Jesus created everything and everything exists by the Lord Jesus Christ. That is irrefutable evidence. The Lord Jesus Christ is not a creation of God, but rather he is the creator God. That's what you have. That's why the book of Colossians is such a fantastic book. You know, you can't get away from the fact that he is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. And uh, it's in verse 20, and having made peace, I like this, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That just sounds like a song or a sermon title to me, the blood of his cross. Isn't that good? Through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Uh, uh, let me stop there and continue on here where I need to be, and I'll come back uh, to the scripture there. Um, you see the, uh, uh, the, um, the, number one, the salutation, we saw that. The prayer for growth in the Lord. Uh, you see the Lordship of Christ uh, there. And uh, <clears throat> we see he is the head of the body, the church. Uh, uh, we see the Lord's ministry of reconciliation. How did he reconcile us? Uh, through the blood of his cross. Uh, it says there in verse number 21, and you that were sometimes aliens, and enemies in your own in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. What a blessing. Find out that, that the blood of Jesus Christ has the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, uh, the Lord is God's minister of reconciliation. Paul, uh, the Lord's minister uh, uh, here uh, in this scripture, teaches us so much about the reconciliation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul even talked about how he shared in the sufferings of Christ and how we share in the sufferings of Christ. Verse number 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And fill up that, ye, uh, that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from this generations, uh, but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So much there. Paul is saying, I, am, I have suffered. Paul is letting them know, I've suffered. I've suffered a lot. And he says, but it's because God was making me his minister of reconciliation to preach this to you. God would allowed me to suffer so that he could use me in a greater capacity. And, uh, and, and, and what, a, what a testimony. You know, the sufferings that the Lord allows us to go through on this earth. And uh, life's not easy. It's tough. And it gets, just gets harder. You know, and, and our hearts get broken and things happen. And we suffer. And, uh, but Paul said, listen, this is suffering is God's setting me aside to be his minister. What a, what, a, what a spiritual response to the sufferings of life that Paul had. And then he said, and to make known this mystery, this great mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. What a wonderful uh, 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 knowledge to know. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, so uh, his concern uh, for all the saints that were in this particular valley here, as we said a moment ago, is like a triad of churches there, uh, there with uh, Hierapolis and uh, or Aeropolis and uh, and Laodicea and uh, and and um, and Colossians, the Colossae church, and 
<coughs> he teaches us here in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He has concerns for them. For I would that you know what is the great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my, flesh, my face in the flesh. All, you, none of you see me. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And uh, Paul, is he's not buttering them up, but he does realize that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And, uh, and that's what Paul is doing here. Uh, never met you. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Paul, but you've never met him before. So it's probably a good idea if Paul maybe breaks the ice a little bit and diffuses anything to let you know we're on the same team and he's for you. And that way he can continue with verse number four, which he says, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now he says, now I'm going to warn you. Now it's come time to give you the warning. We've talked about, you know, uh, uh, my greeting to you and how thankful I am and never seen your faces, but thank God for you. And I'm suffering and I have been suffering so that God could use me to this position that he has me in so that I could tell you about the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and, uh, and, and all of you that have not seen my faith, both there and at Laodicea, uh, I, I'm praying that your hearts would be comforted and, uh, and, and, and together in love and all the riches and fullest understanding and all that so that I could say to you, I don't want someone to beguile you with enticing words. You need to be careful because there's going to be folks that are going to come with enticing words and try to lure you away. And Paul was trying to warn them of that. Um, they did not have the same advantage that you and I have. They did not have the completed word of God. So these, these, these folks, now they have advantages that we did not have, obviously, which is they, they were uh, there during the apostolic age, and so they got to see miracles that you and I will never see until we see the Lord. Uh, but... Uh, they got to see all kinds of neat things. So they had advantages that you and I do, do not get to enjoy. But you and I have an advantage that they don't, which is far better, by the way, than the apostolic miracles, which is we have a more sure word of prophecy, which is the word of God. And so he's telling them there's going to be folks that are going to come with enticing words. And he says, be careful. Don't let them beguile you. Don't let them uh, fool you. Uh, be very careful. And, and he needed to tell them that because they were at a distinct disadvantage without having the doctrinal books of the Bible, which come from the epistles of Paul. That's where we get a lot of our doctrine is from Paul's epistles. They, they weren't, God wasn't done giving them to Paul to give to everybody. They didn't have them. And so he's saying, be careful. Now, we today have the doctrine, but I say, we still better be careful that we don't let somebody beguile us through enticing words. Because it happened them then to those saints who are at a disadvantage, and it still happens today to our saints who are at an advantage, but it's a cry and shame because we see it works. And people get called away with these enticing words, and you say, man, read your Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto God. You know, know what the Bible says. Compare these things with Scripture and see if they be so. You know, study to show thyself approved. Uh, we, we live in a day and age which there's a lot of people with enticing words. It's the last days. We all know that we're seeing an increase in pestilence. The Bible said there would be. We're seeing an increase in earthquakes. The Bible said there would be. You know, increase in wars. The Bible said there would be. We're seeing an increase in false prophets. The Bible said there would be. And, and if they're there, we have to be careful to sniff them out. Be careful who you lend your ear to. You know, there's that old adage. You've probably heard this before. Well, you, you know, you've got to chew the meat and spit out the bone. There's truth to that. Because nobody's perfect, you know. There's times where I say things that are imperfect and wrong. We all do. 
You know, I'm not above anybody else. We all mess up, you know. But I will tell you this, there's a difference between maybe being wrong on something minor, you know, and having a different opinion. Let's say the foundation of the church. I believe Christ started the church with his apostles, his disciples, and, uh, and, um, and it was in its embryonic stage, you know. And then when Christ sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat, it was basically the day that birthed us into the church age, you know. And, uh, and, and, and then when, 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 when the day of Pentecost was come, that's the day the church was empowered, you know, and uh, all that. Uh, there are some people who believe the church started at Pentecost. That's just like us. They're just like us. Church is just like us. Church started at Pentecost. We're going to be all right. I think I can go to church with a pastor who believes the church started at Pentecost. I think I'll be fine, you know. Uh, I got a, a dear friend of mine, uh, uh, and I can't seem to get a hold of him or his daughters or anybody, but uh, Brother Dick Frost, I hope he's okay, I don't know. But, uh, you know, he, he and I disagreed on lots of things. I'd go to his house, and he'd talk the Bible with me, and we'd talk about all kinds of stuff, you know, the gap theory. I don't believe in the gap theory. He did. He held to the gap theory. He's a good man. I don't agree with him, you know, and that's okay. There's been people uh, here that have preached at our church that I don't agree with. On everything, but I love them, and we're fine. That's one thing. When somebody's preaching absolute heresy, though, you know, when if everything else is just good, oh, but it's just that one thing where, you know, it's, it's the blood of Jesus doesn't still atone, you know. Uh, the blood of Jesus is, is, is you know, uh, is null and void. You know, well, that's a big one. I'm going to have to say, sorry, I don't want to listen to you anymore. We're done. I'm walking away. You know, so you have to determine what is chew the meat and spit out the, vo- the bone versus what is rat poison because rat poison is 99% protein and 1% poison. You know, and uh, I, I'm not interested in eating rat poison. <laughs> and uh, so figure this out. Nobody's perfect, but at the same time, those 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 cardinal doctrines of our faith, I, th- that's a deal breaker for me. That's an absolute deal breaker for me. Um, anyways, you got to be careful with all that. Uh, there's false prophets then, there's false prophets today. And, uh, and, and, and here Paul is, is talking to them about the, 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 the false teachings that were taking place there, uh, the completeness and sufficiency of Christ. He talks about in chapter 2, uh, verses 8 through 15, he says, Beware lest any man tell you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after, uh, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ." <clears throat> for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. I, I, if I'm not careful, I preach a whole book. I enjoy it too much. But, but did you see verse number nine? It said, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the body, Godhead bodily. Fullness, fullness or completeness. All right, so we find out that, 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 in the Lord Jesus Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Well, what is the Godhead? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ is completed in the Godhead. He's full. It's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's what he says here. Now look what he says in verse 10. And ye are complete in him. Now, we're complete in him. So, so the Lord Jesus Christ dwelleth in him, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Completed. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, completed. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. And then he says, and you, ye, are complete in him. And how am I complete in him? Well, it's the same thing. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What are we? Spirit, soul, and body. When we were born, our spirit was dead. I know this is a review, but our spirit was dead. And so there we were. Two-thirds of a man, you know. But in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him because the Lord Jesus Christ came to live in your spirit in the form of the Holy Spirit. He regenerated your spirit, made it alive, and so where you were just two-thirds of a human, now that spirit has come alive. You are three-thirds, just like the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God. Here you are, uh, spirit, soul, and body. And he said there, and ye also 
The Lord is complete in the Godhead, and you are complete in Christ because the Holy Spirit came to live inside of your spirit and regenerate your spirit. There's nothing but completeness going on here, you know? And last I checked, three-thirds is one whole, and uh, you are complete in Christ. And so uh, let's, uh, let's continue on there. Verse number 11, in whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off uh, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith uh, of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. There's another great sermon title, The Operation of God. What is the operation of God? Well, he gives us what, you know, you say, um, what, what, what's the operation of God? You know, well, you think of some surgeon, a scalpel, you know, here's my scalpel, you know, light, I need all these different things, you know, forceps, all you got to have there. What is the operation of God? Well, I'll show it to you. Verse number 13, and you being dead in your sins and uncircumcised in the flesh, hath he quickened together with him. Here's the operation of God. First, you have the quickening, the quickening. You were dead and he made you alive. This is God's operation in your life. He, he took your spirit, and, he, and, and this, this is how God operated in you to make you a child of God. This is, when, when God made Eve, he did an operation. He took the rib out of Adam, and he made Eve, and that was God's operation in making Eve. And, and, and God's operation in making you alive in Christ was this. He quickened you. Together with him, hath forgiven you of all trespasses. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. So you see here, he took and he, and he, 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 he quickened you, and then, he, and then he, he, this, is, this is him making you alive now. This is him quickening you, making you complete in Christ. He, 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 he made you alive, and he took uh, the ordinances, the, the things that you had sinned against in the Bible, and he, and he blotted them out. Uh, th- so you see the, the quickening, verse 13. You see in verse 14, the blotting. And then you see at the end of verse 14, and took it out of the way, nailing it <clears throat> to his cross. This is the operation of God. Quickened, blotting, nailing. God is nailing what? All of your sins. That's what he's talking about. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. <coughs> My. Who did he nail to the cross? The Lord Jesus Christ. What's another name for the Lord Jesus Christ? The Word. The Word's the law. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and God nailed the law to the cross. That's what we were under, dead unto sin, you know? He nailed it to his cross. He nailed our sins. What happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, The Bible says, and he became sin for us who knew no sins, that we might be made the righteousness of God through, through him. He became sin for us. So when Jesus Christ was cursed on the cross of Calvary, you know the cursing that took place as God turned his back on the sun, the world went dark, and you see that the cursing that took place, Jesus is becoming sin. And this is the operation of God. This is him saving you. This is him quickening you and blotting your sin and, and nailing it, turning it into Jesus and, and nailing your sin to the cross of Calvary. It says there, and having spoiled principalities, verse 15, and powers, made a show of them openly, and triumphing over them in it. <laughs> all the principalities and powers, all these other religions and everything, on that glorious day, God made a show of it all. And God, God, God openly triumphed over everything. It was a glorious day that took place that day. And then I love what he says in verse number 16. He says, let No man therefore judge you. (laughs) Don't judge me anymore. It's under the blood. I'm saved. I am a result of the operation of God. You know, I, I am here as a result of the operation of God. God operated on me, if you will. And, and he quickened me, and he blotted out my sin, and he nailed him to the cross. So, so, so don't you judge me. 
Somebody says, well, you know, you, 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 you're a sinner just like everybody else, and you, you did this, and, and just like the devil likes to remind us of our past, you know, and look at who you were, look at what you've done. Don't judge me. My sins are under the blood. My sins are nailed to the cross. I've been made alive. I am complete in Christ. Uh, you know, d- d- Paul is, Paul of all people, writing this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul of all people, I mean, a murderer. He, he, he hated Christians and, and, he, and he did everything he could to try to destroy the name of Jesus. And you could point at Paul and you could say, Paul, you tried to destroy that name. You tried to destroy the faith. You killed Christians. And Paul could say, don't you judge me. It's under the blood. I've been forgiven. I'm a new man in Christ. And so he continues on about this, uh, this operation of Christ, and, and, uh, and, and we'll continue and look in verse number four, chapter 3 and verse number 1. He says, if you then be risen with Christ, if you're like me and you're saved, you're born again. If you've been risen with Christ, you were dead and trespassed in sin, but now you're alive, you're saved The operation of God has been performed on you. He said, if you're risen with Christ, here's what you need to do. Seek those things which are above. Child of God, what are we seeking after? What are we seeking after in this world? Paul said, seek after those things which are above. We got to be careful about what we're seeking because we get what we focus on. And you know, if all we're seeking is temporal things, we're wasting our life here. We're wasting our life. I was telling somebody last night, I said, listen, there's two things you've got to think about. We have this life here, here and now. What are you going to do with this life? And I said, you've got you to make wise choices. I said, because there's a life to come, and we're going to see God forever. You know? And uh, seek those things, he said, which are above. As children of God, if you're risen with Christ, Seek after that which is eternal, not that which is temporal, because this is all going to pass away. And then look what he says, verse number two. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. He says, I want you to seek after the things which are above. That's what you should be going after. And then he says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. My affection, my heart. He says, you need to make sure that your heart is set on the things above. You you have to be in love with it. You have to be in love with the things that are above. And you say, how on earth can I set my heart? I I don't want to love the things of this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to love the Lord with my whole heart. I want to love the things above. And how do I set, as a believer, how do I set my affection? Go back to the first point. Seek those things which are above. Now, if I seek those things which are above, I'm going after, I'm seeking after the things which are above. I'm trying to live my life for that which is eternal, not that which is temporal. What am I doing? I'm not laying up for myself treasures on earth, but rather I'm laying up myself treasures in heaven. Now, where your treasure is, here it is, there will your heart be also. Not where your heart is, there will your treasure be also, as I've heard so many preachers and Christians misquote. Where your treasure is, set your affection on things above. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and rust, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Seeking after those things which are above. And I am therefore laying up myself treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Set your affections on things above. How can I... Fall in love with God and fall in love with heaven and the things of the Lord and the, that which is eternal. You have to seek after those things now. And then you're laying up treasures in heaven. And guess what happens? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your heart has a way of chasing after your treasures and finding where they are. He says in verse number three, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. He talks about a sacrifice here. 
He says, you need to remember this. You got to die. Seek after the things which are above. Set your affection on things above. And then he talks about sacrificing in verse number three. You're dead. You're dead. He elaborates this in verse number five. Look what he says in verse number five. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, <coughs> inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Paul says in verse number three, you're dead. How are you dead? Because you mortify in your body the members These things, fornication, uncleanness. You're saying, if you've been risen with Christ, now I want to die to self. I want to seek after those things which are above. I want to lay up myself treasures in heaven because I want to set my affection up there. I want to be in love with God. I want to be in love with the Lord like it should be and the things that are above and that which is eternal, not that which is temporal. And now that I'm laying all this up in heaven and I'm, and I'm letting my heart chase after my treasure and I'm falling in love with the Lord and all of that, now I have to turn around and look at this, these, these things that were a part of my life before I was saved and I have to say, I'm going to mortify you. I don't want to be involved in this anymore. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, uh, covetousness, idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications. I want it out of my mouth and out of my life. So now we're mortifying the deeds of the flesh. We're saying, I want to seek after God. Treasures in heaven. I want my heart to follow it. And I want to die to self and die to these things uh, that I used to be. I want to put these things off. And look what he says in verse 10. And have put on. So what am I doing in verse number nine? Put off the old man. What am I doing in verse 10? Put on the new man. I'm new in Christ. I'm a new creature. My, My sins are nailed to the cross. The operation of God has taken place in my life. I'm born again. Now I want to set up for myself treasures in heaven. I want my heart to follow. I want to be in love with God. I want to get rid of the sin that's in my life. I want to serve God. I want to put off the old man and I want to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, uh, 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 I always say it wrong, Scythian, uh, bond nor free, but Christ is all And in all, he says, put on the new man. Get rid of all of your prejudices, all of that, and just love everybody. He says in verse number 10, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so, do ye, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. He says, you got to put these things off. you got to put these things off. Get rid of these things in your life. Mortify it. Die to self. Put off the old man and put on the new man. And when you do, you're going to see bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. When you and I can't get along with one another or others, all we're doing is reminding ourselves that we're still wearing the old man 
And we need to put off the old man and put on the new man. And you say, well, I did that years ago. Well, it's been a long time then, had that. You better do it again. Well, don't you just mortify and die to self once? No, your, your, your old, old man resurrects. He's got a way of resurrecting daily and sometimes hourly. That's why Jesus told his disciples, he said, take up your cross, not mine. Take up your cross daily. He used the word daily. Bring your cross with you daily because you've got to die to self every single day. You have to put off the old man and put on the new man. You've got to mortify all these evil deeds so that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God uh, because as long as the old man is there and he's running the show and he's sitting in the driver's seat, then the Holy Spirit is not. But if you'll mortify that, and then the Holy Spirit, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit will just come oozing out of your life and you will have that kindness and humility and meekness and mildness and long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. All that you need. Friend, that's hard. It's very hard. We get hurt. And our instant reaction is we want to defend ourselves. We want to hurt somebody back or we want to protect ourselves. I can't let you hurt me again. You hurt me, so I got to protect myself from you. But that's not Christ-likeness. That's somebody who's worried about himself, not dead to self. We have to put on the old man, put off the old man and put on the new man. And look what he says. If you do all this, here's, what you, here's the reward. The reward of seeking those things which are above, setting your affection up there, falling in love with God, mortifying, sacrificing yourself. Uh, here's the reward in verse number 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God. You do all these things, and you know what? Just relax and let the peace of God rule in your heart. You can have the peace of God because you say, I know I did the right thing. Look, you may be upset with me, and, but I know that I did the right thing. And I can pillow my head tonight because I know I did the right thing. That's what he says. Then you can just let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You know, not everybody's going to like you. That's a fact. You know, try being a pastor, you know, and, and you get to be people's smoke screens. Why they don't want to serve God. So they want to blame somebody. So they look at you and they say, well, you. <laughs> and you say, I was just trying to love you, you know. And uh, you get to be punching bag for people. If you're not careful, you want to punch back. That's the flesh. That's, not, that's, that's the old man. If you put off the old man, you put on a new man, you just love, just be nice. You're heaping coals of fire on their head, and you get to enjoy the peace of God. And that's just all there is to it. It's not an easy road, but the Lord helps you. And then he says in verse number 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You're not going to have peace and you're not going to have a song if you're filled with anger and bitterness. You'll lose your song. You'll lose your peace. He says, why don't you let all this dwell in you richly? Let it dwell in you. Don't let somebody take away your song. Don't let someone take away your song. Don't let somebody take away your joy. You just keep serving the Lord. You love them. They hurt you. It's fine. Let God take care of that. You just love them anyways. And don't lose your song. Don't lose your joy. Because it hurts. Trust me, it hurts. But you just keep on. And then, uh, and then he says in verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and, to the, fa I'm sorry, and the Father by him. Uh, that's, Curtis Hudson used to say, you wanna, when you're trying to decide a questionable thing in life, uh, whether you should do it or not, and the Bible doesn't specifically think, uh, speak on one of these things, he would go to this verse and say, can you do it in the name of the Lord? Can you do this activity in the name of Jesus? And he says, if you can't do this activity in the name of Jesus, then you probably shouldn't be doing this activity, you know, and, uh, on how to decide questionable things. I think we have a little pamphlet of it in our bookstore uh, there. But uh, then he gets to, uh, our favorite verses of Scripture in all of Colossians, verse number 18. 
Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Amen. I just want to park there for a while, but there's no women here tonight, so I guess I'll move on. But that's one of my favorite scriptures. It just touches my heart. It really does. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents. This, this sounds a lot like familiar, doesn't it? Does it sound a lot like Ephesians chapter number five? You know, it does. And you'll see it as Paul writes his letters. There's a lot of, not, it's not exactly repetition. Uh, you know, there's little changes here and there. But he's got a letter going to the church at Ephesus, but he's also got to write to the churches at Colossae, you know, and Laodicea and, 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 and Hierapolis. And so he's, he's writing these letters and saying, hey, you know, I got to repeat it because they need to hear it too. And uh, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, verse 21, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey your masters and all of that. And, uh, <clears throat> and he continues on in verse number four, masters, or chapter four, verse one, masters given to your servants that which is uh, equal. And um, verse six, let your speech always with, be always, let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Friend, that is helpful. That is so helpful. Close it. Close it. You have to use your fingers. Use your fingers. Close it. You know, don't just speak out. Slow down. Pray. And let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt. May God help us in that area. Our mouths, oh man, we just get mad and <laughs> blurt out, you know. But 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 speak as becometh a saint, you know. Be careful, little tongue, what you say, you know. We we talk about sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I'm like, well, that's not true because words have hurt me many times, you know. And uh, words can hurt right to the heart. They might not break a bone, but they can break a heart, you know. And, uh, and so we just be careful what you say and uh, ask the Lord to help you uh, with, with your speech and be it seasoned, seasoned with love, with salt, you know, the gospel and all of that uh, everywhere uh, that you go. May God help us with that. Our, our speech is so very, very important. Uh, I'm learning this as I'm getting older. I, I just used to just talk all the time, talk, 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 you know, and then I'm like, you know, it's probably a good idea if a man of God slows down a little bit and is careful what he says. Because that my tongue gets me in more trouble than anything else I know, you know. Uh, gets me in more trouble than my kids get me in trouble, and that's pretty pretty bad. Uh, and so, anyways, now now you see the 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 conclusion there is he's he's uh, telling them to greet all the different people that they know uh, together in the Lord. Uh, there they 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 know all some of the same people. And he's saying salute them, tell them tell them what's up for me, you know, <laughs> and uh, tell them hello and all that. And then uh, and then he comes to the end, verse number 18 of, of chapter four. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. And he says, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. He said, would you just, would you remember my bonds? You know, of all, of all that's going on in here that God has given Paul to write through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's almost like God said, Paul, you can go ahead and write it. Remember my bonds. You know, and, uh, and Paul's saying, don't, don't forget about me. Don't forget about what I'm going through. Remember my bonds. And that's an admonition for all of us believers. Our life sometimes can be just, just on plane. Just everything's moving along. We're busy. And we're, we're going through life on plane. Everything's fine. But meanwhile, there's other believers in Christ who things are tough for them. They're really hard on them right now. And if we're not careful, we'll just get so busy doing that we forget to be. You know what I mean by that? So busy doing Christian work that we forget to be a Christian. And uh, remember my bonds, Paul said. It's good for us to remember people who, who need to be remembered, who need a little help. And, uh, you know, my wife has taught me this lesson so, so well because I, I, I can be, just like anybody else, very self-centered thinking about my problems and what I got to get done and my, my schedule and what, what I got on my plate and my, 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 me, me, me. And uh, she'll, she'll just be putting together a basket for somebody. What are you doing? Oh, I got to go deliver this to somebody, you know? And uh, the basket for somebody today, it was, 
It was pot roast for somebody's family last night who's sick. You know what I mean? She's always doing for others. I mean, honestly, we've got the best pastor's wife in the world. I mean, that's just a fact. And I don't say it because she's my wife. I mean, that. she's not even here and she'll never hear this. But I'm telling you, there's nobody in the world like her who cares like she cares about people. And she remembers people's bonds. And I don't. I'll pray for you, but I'm busy. You know what I mean? And she'll, she'll dial it back and pull me off a plane and say, somebody's hurting right now and we need to go let them know we love them. You know? And um, man, I tell you what, this is what Paul was saying. He says, hey, in all that you're doing there, don't forget about me. Remember what I'm going, I'm in prison, man. I'm in a Roman prison. <laughs> you know, remember my bonds. <laughs> You know, don't forget about me. Say a prayer for me, you know, and, uh, and, and, and don't put me out of your mind. Um, it's, it's 7.30. I could dive into um, uh, 1 Thessalonians, but I honestly, I think that's probably a good place to stop. I know this has taken me longer than what uh, I wanted to for New Testament survey, but I should have known going into it that it's just the way it's going to be. But uh, Colossians is, is quite the book. It's quite the book. And... Um, you know, I, I, I love it. I, I, I can just preach it all night long. All right, well, we'll pray. And uh, does anybody have anything tonight that we need to be praying for? I didn't hear how Ms. Myra's doctor's appointment went today. Is it okay? It went good. They're changing your medication. You try to back on some things and offset some problems. It's just starting to happen. And did they call in for any more blood work, or did they do any blood work today? Uh, no, not today. Okay. All right, so hopefully that... Um, is what did he say anything about maybe that had anything to do with the sickness she was enduring, or is that unrelated? No, she didn't say her piece of pizza. She, uh, she didn't seem to think that that was having any major effect on these other things. Cause okay, the yeah, I don't know enough about the human body to know, but I thought, well, she's coming off of this, and maybe that's that one. So, yeah. okay, um, so we'll pray for Miss Myers. Is there anything else we should be praying for tonight? Brother Jeremy's under the weather, his, his family's doing better. Um, you know, the, sometimes you think, man, you know, we can't get over it. You know, it was, it was Emmy, Emma, Emmy, I'm sorry, Emmy Lou and, uh, and, uh, and Kimmy, Emmy and Kimmy uh, were sick. And, and they were getting better, and then Gracie gets sick. And, then, uh, and now she's, she's starting to get better, now Jeremy's sick. And you think, man, it's just like one after another. And it's like, but that's honestly, that's, that's grace. Because, hey, if you're all sick at once, that's horrible. You know, you need somebody to help take care of somebody else, you know? And, uh, and so God spaced it out for them. So that's actually a good thing. Uh, so we'll be praying for them. Sir? Uh, he's been missionary with Macedonian Bobby Walston. Got Say his name one more time. Bobby Walston. Uh-huh. Was a missionary with uh, Macedonia. Macedonia. Um, he's facing some, some, uh, some back surgery. And he's just requesting prayer. So Bobby Walston, back surgery. Missionary to Costa Rica? He was a missionary to Costa Rica. I've never been to Costa Rica, but I heard it's so beautiful. Have you been there? Twice. Twice. I've heard Costa Rica is absolutely gorgeous. I've had the opportunity to go a couple times, but never got to get over there because um, other things were taking place. I was asked to go there and speak at a, a school and an orphanage and stuff like that, maybe one of these days. Um, anything else? Any other prayer questions? All right. Well, let's pray for these. <clears throat> Father, we pray for Brother Jeremy. Ask you, dear Lord, that you'll be with him and his family. Strengthen them, please, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray for Miss Myra. I pray, dear Lord, for good uh, results there to uh, these things that she's got going on. She's, Lord, I just pray for just a healing, Lord. Just, just continue to touch and heal her. And you've been so good to him and uh, to her and Brother Brad, and I pray that you'll continue to be with him. And uh, Brother Walston, Lord, I pray that you'll be with him with the back surgery upcoming. Uh, Lord, all of us who have back problems know how difficult that is, and we ask you that you'll be with him, uh, Lord, during this time. And uh, Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we search for a location for our school. I pray that you'll open that door, dear Father, and open it wide and show us exactly what you'd have uh, for us, and uh, just continue to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And we'll thank you for that. Bless the church, Lord. It was such an encouragement today to go through uh, the meeting with Mrs. Linda and look at the financials and how you have just tremendously, tremendously bless this church. And uh, Lord, we thank you for that. I ask you to continue to keep your hand upon this church and, uh, and help us to walk close to you. And uh, Father, um, uh, we just pray for this coming week, tomorrow, church, and 
And Saturday, soul winning, and Sunday, church. We just ask the Lord to continue to uh, bless this church in a great way. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thank you for watching. Uh, God bless you.